Learning how to prove things in mathematics can be really infuriating. You have spent over a decade learning math from arithmetic to algebra to calculus and differential equations, but suddenly you are told you can't even use any of it, not even the arithmetic, without going through very tedious steps to justify your work. It's like you're MacGyver, where you know the fastest way to resolve a problem is to, say, use calculus, but all you have is a paperclip and some bubblegum. Even looking at Rudin's text that builds all of calculus up from scratch, you can tell he wants to use the mean value theorem in one of his proofs, but since it's so far away, he has to invent a way around it. Today I'm going to talk to you about one of these constructions, and that is for exponentials. There are about a dozen ways to define real exponent of a real number, but many of them really involve some heavy machinery, like power series or my favorite method, which is differential equations. I'll show you that one at the end of the video. Instead, our paperclip is the existence and uniqueness of positive n through some positive real numbers, where n is a natural number, and our bubblegum is the least upper bound property. With just these tools, how can we define something like b to the x for b greater than 1 and an x a real number? This is exactly problem 6 from chapter 1 in Rudin's Principles of Mathematical Analysis. Arguably, it's the hardest problem in the chapter, and the first thing we need to prove is that the concept of raising a real number to a rational number is well defined. From there, we can show the quantity can also be defined through the least upper bound property. I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights of the proof, though if you want to pause the video for a second and see if you can come up with a solution yourself, I encourage you to. Just be sure to come back. YouTube doesn't like it when people do that and leave early in a video. Let me set the mood real quick. Okay, now that we've had a chance to think about the problem, let's start proving it. The biggest thing to remember is that mathematically, we've never heard of an exponential. If we have two different representations of a positive rational number, R represented as m over n or p over q, we don't know that if we raise a b greater than 1 to the nth power and then take the nth root, if that should be the same as b raised to the pth power and then taking the qth root. If they are different, then saying b raised to the r could mean at least two different things, and that'd be a big problem. We're going to show in the first part that each representation gives the same answer. If you're wondering how in the world we'd do that, well, there is only one tool we have so far that would do it. The uniqueness of integer roots. Right now, it's the only thing we can leverage that will result in equality. So we start off with uh, this quantity here, uh, b to the m raised to 1 over n, and we're also going to have this quantity here, b to the p raised to 1 over q. What we'd like is at the end of the day be able to say that they're the same thing, but we can't just do that just by showing that they are raised to the same rational power, because that's not necessarily well defined, and that's exactly what we're trying to show. What we're going to use is we're going to use theorem 1.21, and that says that if each of these guys are the same integer root of the same real number, then they have to be the same number themselves. And so we just need to look for the right answer. The right thing to do is to try to get rid of these exponents, and that should morally be able to help us. So what I'm going to take is I'm going to take n and q, I'm going to multiply them together, and I'm going to exponentiate both of these guys to the same power. And we know at the end of the day that this should get us roughly the same spot. So let's go ahead and exponentiate them and see what we get. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and split off this n and q. And this is something you show works by induction, by the way. It isn't something that's self-evident. And so we get b to the m raised to the 1 over n, and this raised to the nth power raised to the qth power. That agrees, but this you show by induction. Now the n cancels the 1 over n, and so then that makes this b to the m time uh, raised to the qth power. And uh, by the exact same reason we could do this, we can work it backwards, so that gives us b to the m times q. This guy is exactly the same, and uh, if I raise this to the n qth power, we're going to end up getting b raised to the p nth power. So these do look like two different numbers, but I'm going to show you that they're actually the same. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at r, and we're going to take a look at r minus r is 0. What we can do is we can go ahead and you know, do our usual uh, fraction stuff. So I'm going to rewrite these guys as m over n minus p over q, and then that's going to give me mq minus pn over n times q. And the only way that this can be equal to 0 is if uh, mq is equal to pn. But what do we have over here? We have mq and we have pn. And so that means that these two guys 
are equal. B to the m raised to the 1 over n and b to the p raised to the 1 over q are the nqth roots of, uh, say, b to the pn. Therefore, they are the same. Positive real roots of positive real numbers are unique, right? So that's theorem 1.21. Wow, okay. That seemed dramatically complicated for such a simple fact. This was only for rational exponents. We haven't even defined what it means for real exponents yet. You know what's not complicated? Hitting that like button. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but it would help me out. The next part shows that b raised to the r plus t is the same as b raised to the r times b raised to the t. This again follows from uniqueness in theorem 1.21 and raising each side to the right power. But I'll leave that to you guys. We now know that it makes sense to write not b raised to the 1 over n raised to m, but b raised to m over n, and we can change that m over n to p over q without changing the final number. Now let's give a different equivalent representation of the rational exponent of b. Let b be the set of all b raised to the t for t up rational and less than r. Rudin posits that the least upper bound of br is the same as b raised to the r. This uses the least upper bound property and will ultimately provide a definition of real exponents. Indeed, we simply define b raised to the x as the least upper bound of bx. So let's prove this guy. We first need to show that br has an upper bound. It'll help us to prove this claim first. For rational s less than rational t, b to the s is less than b to the t when b is greater than one. Let s be s1 divided by s2 and t be t1 divided by t2. We know that s is less than t if and only if s1 times t2 is less than s2 times t1. Each of these are integers, and so we know that for b greater than one, we have b raised to these terms preserves the inequality. We know from the proof of theorem 1.21 that if we take the same root of each side of the inequality, it is preserved. So take the t2s2 root, and we get the claim. Now we know that if s is a rational number larger than r, then b raised to the t is less than b raised to the s for all t, and br has an upper bound, and thus, a least upper bound. If we take a look, uh, we have the set BR that we talked about earlier, where you have B raised to T and T being less than or equal to R. So it's a collection of all rational powers of B, uh, where those rational powers are less than R. And so what we're going to do is we're going to prove that B to the R is exactly the least upper bound of the set. It, it should be. I mean, morally, I mean, if you just look at this, I mean, the biggest number here is r, and so b to the r should be that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that if we have t being less than or equal to r, then we get b to t is less than or equal to b to the r by the lemma. b to the r is an upper bound of br, and now let's suppose that y is equal to uh, the supremum of br, and or the least upper bound of br, and y is strictly less than br. Let's see if we can show that uh, this is going to be a contradiction. So what we're trying to do is leverage the idea of continuity. There should be a t really close to r that we should be able to squeeze between y and br here. We don't have continuity yet, so we have to kind of work with what we got. Let me, let's just go ahead and write our goal. So our goal here is we're going to have, we're going to try to nudge something underneath r. So we're going to have r minus 1 over n, and this is going to be less than b to the r. We just don't know what that n should be. Morally, we know that if n is large enough, then it's going to get very, very, very close to br, and it's going to be larger than y. Saying n is large enough for integers n in the real numbers, that should really cue you to what is called the Archimedean property. Uh, this is something in an exponent, so that doesn't necessarily work, uh, or at least not directly from the Archimedean property. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by br. I'm going to have this, and it's going to be less than b raised to the minus 1 over n, and so that's actually the same as 1 over b raised to 1 over n. And if I take the nth power of both sides, I'm going to get an nth power here, I'm going to get 1 over b. I should be able to pick a large enough n such that this quantity will get underneath 1 over b. This quantity we know is less than 1 because br is already bigger than y. So when we divide them, it is less than 1. So another way to say this, and this is going to be a sort of a lemma that we'd want to verify, and if you want to go ahead and prove that, it actually is just the Archimedean property proof. Uh, you just have to exchange all the minuses and pluses with multiplication and division, and you change out your least upper bound property with the greatest lower bound property. But it all 
works out exactly the same. And if you're ever wondering, you know, how you're supposed to come up with these proofs looking at uh, this book, well, the idea is that I, I mean, I didn't come up with a new Archimedean property proof. I just literally went back to the section and was like, how did you prove that again? And I just started working it backwards in, in this new context. And so there is some n where that works out. And so then we verified this, you know, barring that you go through and do that proof. And so then once you found that n where this works, uh, this is a contradiction because r minus 1 over n is in q and r is less, r minus 1 over n is less than r, right? Which means it is inside, this quantity is inside of our br and y is supposed to be bigger than all of them. And so that's a contradiction and there you go. That is the proof. And so there you go. That shows us that taking the least upper bound of br actually agrees exactly with b raised to the r because b raised to the r is the least upper bound in that set. And now from here, we can actually get a definition in terms of real numbers. And so we just replace b of r for r a rational number with bx with x a real number. And that, that definition of b is perfectly valid. And so then we can just basically say that this is something that follows from the least upper bound property. And so then the least upper bound of that set is what we will define to be b raised to the x. So piece of cake. So that last part of the question, I'm not gonna do right here. It, it basically is just a matter of playing with least upper bounds. And you will ultimately show that uh, b raised to the x plus y is equal to b raised to the x times b raised to the y for x and y real. And so then that's exponentiation and exponential functions. So that was a hard way. What's an easy way of defining the real exponent of a number? There are several ways to do this. My personal favorite is through Picard's theorem, initial value problems and differential equations. Specifically this one, x dot is equal to x or x prime is equal to x with x of zero is equal to one. <laughs> I know, I know, you're gonna ask, how can we know the solution of this without knowing the exponential function? Well, Picard's theorem says that there is a solution and we know that the solution is unique. So no matter what I find there, it has to be the exponential function. In fact, in this specific case, we know the solution exists for all time, it's strictly positive since it can't pass through the equilibrium at x equals zero and it's strictly increasing. So I can tell you before I even find the solution that it's invertible. What's the solution? You're gonna hate me. I'm gonna call it the exponential function of t. I mean, why not? But right now we don't know anything about that function. It's just a name before we find any of its properties. Now notice that if we look at h of t is equal to the exponent of t plus c for some real c, that h of zero is equal to the exponent of c. And h prime of t is equal to the exponent of t plus c. So h satisfies h prime is equal to h with h of zero is equal to the exponent of t plus c. So h satisfies h prime is equal to h with h of zero is equal to the exponent of c. You know what else satisfies the same differential equation? g of t is equal to exponent of c times exponent of t. And that, that it satisfies this derivative is clear and g of t is equal to the exponent of c times exponent of zero, but exponent of zero is equal to one by definition. So there we go. h and g satisfy the same initial value problem. Picard says that there's only one solution, so they must be the same. Bam! Exponent of t plus c is equal to exponent of c times exponent of t. But how do we get b raised to t now? Well, remember, I told you that exponent of t is strictly increasing positive and its domain is, is all the reals. Well, we can also show that its range is r plus. For a fixed b greater than zero, let y be such that the exponent of y is equal to b. Now we set b raised to t as the exponent of y times t, and yes, that's it. You can quickly verify that b squared agrees with the exponent of 2y and that it holds for all integers and nth roots pass through by theorem 1.21's uniqueness again. What that tells us is that a b raised to the rational numbers is going to agree exactly with what we showed before in this exercise. And so then from there, everything else would have to agree. So these are actually the same exact function. I love when I can just resolve something with a right differential equation, just like in this video, where I did it for all of trigonometry from differential equations and no geometry. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's always a pleasure to make this for you. Please consider subscribing if you haven't, and thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.